Welcome everybody to our very last class in our five week series. And tonight's topic is plant problems. Um, we have two very special guest speakers tonight. We're going to start out with um, Hattie Braun, who is the County Director for Coconino County Cooperative Extension and the Master Gardener Program Coordinator. And she's been doing that since what, 2004, Hattie? You've been working in the 2003. Master 2003. And Hattie's going to be presenting on um, plant problems. And um, when Hattie wraps up, we will have Cindy Murray, who you may recognize from the gardening, et cetera, column in the Arizona Daily Sun. And she has been a Coconino County Master Gardener for 10 years. Um, before that, she was a biologist and she lives in Timberline. And she is going to show us how she keeps pocket gophers out of her garden, which is a very, um, popular topic. I've actually been getting emails about it because a lot of people in this town deal with pocket gophers. So if you don't, you're pretty lucky. And uh, with that, I'll just um, ask everybody to please mute yourselves so we don't distract our speakers. And um, Hattie, take it away. I, I just have to say one thing about uh, pocket gophers. If you need any, um, you can go over to Killip Elementary School because they're doing that. They're tearing things down so they can do build a new school. And there's a giant population of pocket gophers. And I was wondering, where are they going to go? Maybe to Gail's house. So, no. Okay. So, so with that, hi everyone. Welcome. We're going to talk about um, pests and diseases in vegetable gardens. And I'm going to share my screen. And if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat or, um, yeah, you can interrupt me. We don't have that many people on the call right now. So um, this is a challenge for many people um, that are trying to um, grow a vegetable garden. And even for folks that are really experienced and have been doing it for 20 or 30 years, sometimes all of a sudden you get something new and you just don't know what to do. So we're gonna just talk about how, how um, we can tackle some of these problems and, um, and how to think about it. So the first thing I wanna talk about is integrated pest management. And that's gonna be our approach to solving our disease or pest problems. And in pest, it could be you know, insects. I'm gonna talk about insects. Um, but Cindy's going to talk about um, a pocket gopher, and there could be other rodents that are causing problems, or it could be birds, or it could be wildlife, or it could be weeds. But in this talk, we'll just talk about insects and diseases and abiotic problems, and then Cindy will talk about pocket gophers. So when we think about controlling our problems, we want to think about using integrated pest management and using a combination of methods to reduce that pest population. And by doing this, we the first thing that we do, we see a problem, we say, oh my goodness, I have aphids. The first thing um, that sometimes people used to do is grab that pesticide and spray. Well, that's gonna be the last thing we do. And we're gonna try to use some other management techniques so we don't have to use as many pesticides. And it could be an organic pesticide or a, um, a non-organic pesticide, but even organic pesticides can have an effect on the environment and maybe affect um, um, insects or animals that you didn't really want to harm. So the real key to integrated pest management is first ID the problem. And, and um, we get many calls into the extension office and sometimes it's not really a problem um, per se. It's not caused by a pest or a disease, but it, you know, really like 10 or um, 15 years ago, but people wanted to know what they could spray. And so that's not how we're gonna approach this. So we see what the problem is. And then we have to figure out, is it really a problem? So we got powdery mildew on our zucchini plants. We're still gonna get more zucchini than we really want. So is it really a problem? It's a problem if you need to have your garden looking beautiful and you don't wanna have fungus on the leaves. So you have to think about what is unacceptable. Um, having a tomato hornworm eat your whole tomato plant to me is very unacceptable. So. Um, but sometimes things aren't really that much of a problem. Um, 
personally, I don't like finding worms in my broccoli, but you can just pick them out. And so maybe it's not that much of a problem. And then we're going to consider some pest management practices and then talk about um, some controls. Um, and the key with integrated pest management is to try to control the pest when it's most susceptible. And often that's when the population is just getting started or they're really small because you don't have to use as much chemical if you have to spray if that um, critter or the insect um, is pretty small. So for integrated pest management, we will monitor for pests. I actually am sitting in my son's bedroom and I just have this, it's now my plant room. So I have these sticky things in here because I have fungus gnats and that's actually how I'm controlling my fungus, fungus gnats. But you can use those sticky cards to monitor for pests. And so sometimes we go out to the garden and we don't really notice anything until all of a sudden there's like 8 million aphids. And then it's kind of hard to just control that many aphids with just water. But so you need to monitor for the pests and just, um, and these little yellow cards are just a great way to just see what's out there in your vegetable garden. Then we're gonna think about are there biological controls such as natural predators or pathogens. There isn't always a bio biological control for everything, but it is something to think about. And also by planting certain flowers that might encourage beneficial insects to um, visit your vegetable garden, maybe those beneficial insects can take care of some of um, those pest problems. So we want to take care of our plants and encourage healthy plants. Anytime plants are kind of stressed or they're spindly, they're going to be more susceptible to problems. So watering correctly, controlling weeds, and then sometimes you have to think about crop, uh, crop rotation because if you have a fungus in the soil from your tomatoes, you probably don't want to put your potatoes in there that next year. And then of course, clean things up. And I know some folks say, oh, but you know, we can leave things, you know, in the garden. It's good for you know, it's good, beneficial insects, it might be good for birds, except you don't want to have diseases to remain, diseases um, remaining in your garden. So you really do need to clean those up. Mechanical control might be something um, physical like tilling and uncovering weed seeds and pest eggs so that they can't survive. Or it might be where you'll put a row cover on so the um, pests can't actually get into your plants. And then you know, we might try several of those um, con those things as a form of control. And if that doesn't work, then we can think about a chemical control and whether we need to use an organic product and sometimes just soapy water is the best thing to do. But every once in a while, you might have to take it a step further and use a non-organic product. But it's a vegetable garden. And I think most people are uncomfortable using something that's not um, an organic product on their vegetable garden. So of course, ID the pest. This is our tomato hornworm right there. And then use the least um, toxic control method that you can. Um, thinking about biological, cultural, or mechanical controls before you're using a pesticide. And as I said in the last slide, even organic products can be harmful to the environment. I'm gonna talk about a few um, organic pesticides. They, they're less toxic, but they still can kill bees. And if you're concerned about bees, that's a reason why you wouldn't want to use those products. And of course, many plants can take, can handle some damage and still produce a great crop. But again, that's, you know, you have to decide what that threshold is. And so, you know, maybe you can just control the pest by trapping or handpicking or squashing or even using a shop vac and vacuuming critters or insects up. And people laugh when I say that, but that's actually a pretty good method. Um, that's not very harmful. Um, you might want to use your shop vac and not your vacuum cleaner that you use in your house. Um, and then of course, physical barriers are really, really great. After I'd heard um, Jim Mass give his vegetable garden talk and he talked about using floating row covers, we've started doing that and we don't have the aphid problems that we've had on our coal crops like we've had in the past. So um, we're gonna talk about insects first. And when you're thinking about insect problems, um, you might want to look for the products from insects. So sometimes you can actually see the insect, but oftentimes you're not going to. And insect, insects leave a lot of stuff 
um, behind them. And so these are some things that you can look at. So um, you can have the honeydew, which is you know, basically pea from, pea, is that a right word for an insect, but from aphids and thrips, you know, they suck in a lot of liquid and then they, um, it all kind of flushes through their body and it has nitrogen in it. And so um, when you see shiny stuff on leaves, it's often honeydew, that could be a sign of thrips or aphids. Um, this um, plant right here actually has sooty mold on it. And this is something that grows on that um, sticky substance that's um, from the honeydew from th thrips and aphids. You might find exoskeletons. You might find fecal spots um, that the insects leave behind. This is something that you'd look for a hand lens. Sometimes I'll see these and I'll go, oh, that might be spores of a disease. But you know, once you've seen these, they get to be a lot easier to identify. And of course, protective cases like in a bagworm um, and then um, frasts from um, insects is a really good way to identify um, problems. And then of course, um, fluffy white stuff, which um, is often a sign of scale insects. So, you know, just be on the lookout for these types of things and then um, it can help you identify it. And of course, um, you can send pictures to um, the Master Gardener program and people can help you identify some of these problems because identification is gonna give you more information of how and how you're gonna control the problem. Oh, and this is our last picture, um, um, like a um, webbing that webworms would be inside of. And this is something we see quite often in um, Northern Arizona in most cases, it's just a cosmetic problem. It's usually not, it isn't something that you have to um, spray anything on. And if you sprayed something on this, they're protected in this case. So it does, it's not very effective. Sometimes if you've had 30 or 40 of these on your trees, that would be a problem. So anyway, um, when we're talking about um, insects, we wanna look at the damage that the pest um, is causing. And you know, especially if we don't see the aphids um, so there's two types of damage and there's damage caused by piercing or sucking mouth parts. And this is when um, the insects suck um, the contents of the cell out and that will cause some curling and cupping of the leaves. And so that's a pretty easy way to tell that you have insects that have piercing sucking mouth parts like aphids or thrips. Then there are the ones that have chewing mouth parts. Um, and so when you see something like this, this kind of damage, that's gonna be an indication that it's um, an insect with a chewing mouth part. And that might, um, that will um, determine what kind of method you might think about controlling the problem. So some chewing examples, of course, cabbage loopers, corn earworms, cutworms, earwigs, flea beetles, skeletonizers, grasshoppers, which most of us know, tomato hornworms and weevils. And I'm not gonna talk about all of, all of them because I do wanna give time um, to Cindy for her talk on pocket gophers, but we'll touch on a couple of these. So cabbage loopers, um, they of course leave these raggedy holes in the leaves. And so it's actually the caterpillar that's causing the problem. And of course, the easiest way to do this is to hand pick them off. Um, I used to, my children found these in organic broccoli one time and they would not eat broccoli after that. And so I, I'm sorry, but I would actually tell them that it, I was serving them non-organic broccoli because they hated these um, critters like this. But you can also use something. So um, cabbage loopers affect broccoli, cabbage, turnip, and radish. And um, you can control them um, by using something called BT. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but this is Bacillus thuringiensis. And that affects um, the larvae of many insects in this caterpillar um, stage. And I'm gonna skip that. I did make a mistake. I loaded up the wrong PowerPoint. Um, so I'm gonna skip a couple of these slides because I wanna make sure I give um, Cindy time. I, I loaded the PowerPoint that was for the page class where I had the whole hour and a half. But um, flea beetles are a problem that most of us get when we, particularly on our cold crops, broccoli, kale, cabbage, collards, and also on radish. Um, I haven't seen it as much on eggplant, tomato, or potato, but these are little tiny specks and 
they really, really love radish. And one of the things you can do is just cover your plants with a floating row cover. Um, you can use a pyrethrum dust, that's from chrysanthemums, but pyrethrum dust is actually pretty toxic stuff. So you wanna be careful how you would use that. But that kind of a dust is really great to put on leaves because the flea beetles will actually eat the dust when they're going after eating the leaves. You can also um, use plant a trap crop, like you can have a container of radishes that's away from your garden and maybe the flea beetles will all go to that container of radishes. And you can also use Carbaryl, which is um, a non-organic product. That the, the brand name of that is often seven. Um, so with Byreth from Dust, that does have a very short, it is an organic product that has a very short shelf life of about two to three days. There is a synthetic um, product. Um, pyrethrum is from chrysanthemums. Um, this synthetic product is called pyrethroid. It lasts a lot longer in the environment. So that would be the reason why you might want to go with the organic product versus the non-organic product. Grasshoppers, we all hate, I guess, but, um, but my chickens do love them. And of course, floating row cover may work, but if we see in this bottom picture, this is a um, type of floating row cover that the grasshoppers actually ate a hole in it. So um, maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. A lot of people like to use no low bait, um, which is from a bacterium, and this affects the gut of the caterpillar, or the caterpillar, the grasshopper, it only affects grasshoppers. And then it's really effective when you treat for small grasshoppers. It's not so effective on the larger ones, but if you treat the small ones, grasshoppers are cannibals and they'll eat their the dead young. And so that's how you can pass on this no low bait. And then it builds up into the population. And of course, birds can help. Um, so no low bait would be in a brand product. So the grasshoppers would eat the brand. You would, um, and then they would get the no low into their system. Carbaryl can also be used in bran um, and that is really effective. One of the reasons why this is, um, it's not sprayed um, and it, you have a lot of control over who, who's eating it and it's mostly gonna be the grasshoppers but it could be dogs and cats and other critters. So you would have to be really careful with that. People used to spray a lot of malathion for grasshoppers and that's not really labeled. Um, for homeowner use anymore. But um, yeah, I had somebody say, I've sprayed malathion for years and it's never made me sick. I, I don't know. I don't think that's a very good idea on your vegetable plants. Tomato hornworms, a lot of us have seen those and you know, you don't see them. And then all of a sudden you see this giant critter here that's like four or five inches long and the whole top half of your tomato plant has been eaten. Um, so these are easy to hand pick. My problem with these is, is I don't really want to squish them because they're so big and it would just be disgusting. But I don't even want to see my chickens eat them. But um, lady beetles and lace wings will eat the eggs. This is a, the tomato hornworm is a caterpillar. So Bacillus thuringiensis or B2 is effective on it. Of course, carbaryl is also effective on it, but tilling the soil after harvest can um, disrupt the eggs and kill off some of the eggs. And there is um, a parasitic wasp that you can also purchase that. And so in this picture here, you see parasitic wasp, wasp eggs on this tomato hornworm. Things aren't going very well for that tomato hornworm. So, um, so those are some examples of chewing um, damage and when the caterpillars of insects or that larval stage is often what's doing the chewing and Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis is really effective on these caterpillars. So that's why it's a really good um, control method after you've thought about some of your other ways to control your problems. So piercing and sucking examples of course are aphids, beet leaf hoppers, um, grape leaf hoppers, squash bugs, stink bugs, and thrips for examples. And of course, we all have aphids. Um, the problem with aphids is they give birth to live aphids. So here's mama aphid and here's baby aphids. And there doesn't have to be a male aphid involved in this whole product um, process. So their populations can really explode. Um, you know, for the page community, um, because they get really warm in, in June, July, and August, 
populations of aphids can decline with heat, we don't really get that warm. We, you know, we have, you know, a half dozen days over 95. I mean, we used to never have any days over 95, but that's still not very warm. So we can have really, really big aphid populations and explosions. So look for the honeydew, um, that um, excretion from the aphids that is kind of like a little sticky syrup. Also look for ants who will um, um, harvest these, well, they actually take care of these aphids. And so some people will call and say, I have aphids all over my plants, how do I treat? Well, it's not really the ants, the ants are there because the aphids are there because um, they, and I actually, I can't remember what their co-relationship is right now. Um, but that would be a sign that you have aphids. Of course, ladybugs, lady beetles, and lace wings. When you have aphids, almost always you're going to see lots of um, lady beetles like this. And of course, um, insecticidal soap works really well on aphids um, using a high pressure hose. And the problem with aphids is that you do have to spray every couple of days. You can't just spray once and say, oh, I've treated my problem. So of course, a floating row cover could be a mechanical control. The problem with ladybugs is that you buy them and they fly away. And so if anybody can figure out how to get the ladybug larvae to hang around your place, you could retire. <laughs> but we haven't figured that out yet. And so right now you purchase ladybugs, you don't really purchase the larvae, but they actually eat a lot. And so aphids, of course, affect all kinds of um, vegetable plants. And I didn't even put tomatoes on here, and, but they can affect almost every, every vegetable plant. And squash bugs. Um, so um, here are some egg clusters. So look at your plants, look underneath the leaves. Um, this is what the little baby squash bugs look like. And sometimes, you know, insecticidal soap can work. So neem oil, which is a product of the neem tree, it's from India, that can work when insects are small. Neem can work as a systemic, it gets inside of the plant. So sometimes these sucking insects um, can suck it into their body, but otherwise it could be a contact um, spray and um, coat the outside of the body. Insecticidal soap, that's gonna be a contact spray and um, suffocate the insects. You can also lay down boards or burlap and trap adult squash bugs underneath. And of course, sanitation. And then we have pyrethrin, which is from, um, pyrethrin is the synthetic form of pyrethrum. And then we have an organic product called spinosad. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. And then finally, we have thrips. And I am watching my time. Um, and this these are sucking insects. So you're going to see this cupping and curling of the leaves. You'll also see these little bare spots where the ins or the thrips have sucked out um, the inside of the cells. So they overwinter under litter on the ground. So raking up the garden at the end of the season could help. Um, sticky traps like this are great for thrips. Um, and the problem with thrips is they really destroy um, the buds and blooms, but neem oil can work. And again, neem oil can be systemic. Insecticidal soap can also work. And then um, lady beetles and thrips um, really affect all kinds of plants and they really affect fruit tree blossoms too. So that's really a bigger problem there. And then finally for insects, um, our last one is spider mite, which is not actually an insect, um, but we throw it in that same category. And it sucks sap from the undersides of the leaves. So you're gonna have leaves curling up, but you often see this webbing on the leaves and you can spray these down with water and insecticidal soaps. But if covering doesn't work and spraying doesn't work and you feel like you need to use a pesticide, you don't use an insecticide, you use something that's called a miticide um, because these are not insects. And so some people do make that mistake. And you know, if you're gonna spray a product and you feel like you need to use that, make sure that you have, um, you're targeting that right insect and using the right product. Okay, so beneficials of course are lady beetles and this, crazy looking thing down here in the bottom is the larva, which really eats a lot of um, 
aphids. And it's just, you know, how can we get them to stay around? And there are also lace wings um, and um, the larvae feed on aphids and other small insects and on mites. And then we have a couple organic insecticides, um, safer um, brand products include horticultural soaps, or you can make your own um, soap using one to two tablespoons of liquid dish soap. The one that's mentioned a lot is Dawn, and you don't want to use that Ultra Dawn, you know, antibiotic, antibacterial, whatever. You want to use something that's pretty simple. Some people use Dr. Bonner's soap. I'm not sure if that peppermint oil in there is good or not. I really don't know, but whatever you do, it's one to two tablespoons. More is not better. Do not use a, a cup of soap because you're really going to damage your plants and test it on a few plants or a few leaves before you spray your whole garden. Um, you can also buy horticulture soaps that contain pyrethrums too. And that's, um, you know, adding something that will um, have be more effective on killing insects. Um, the pyrethrums, um, so these act as um, on the nerve system and they are effective on most garden pests. And then of course there's neem oil, which is from the neem tree seed. And this is effective on leaf miners, white flies, thrips, caterpillars, aphids, mealybugs, spider mites, um, scale crawlers and beetles. This product like many organic products works best when the critters are small and the populations are low. Um, so that's something to think about. And that's why we want you to monitor your plants. Neem oil is also has some um, fungicidal properties too. And so that's one of the reasons why people do like to use it. Like I mentioned, um, Bacillus thuringiensis is um, a bacteria that will affect caterpillars. There's a couple different kinds. And this Christakii um, affects caterpillars. That's what you're going to see in your garden. So if you go into the nursery, that's often the one that you're going to see that you can buy. But there is uh, one that's specific to fly larvae. And then there's one that's effective on beetles. And then there is one effective on mosquito larvae. And I don't remember which one that is. But you know, if you have mosquito problems, you can buy these. Or if you have like a little pond and you're worried about mosquitoes, you can buy these little um, donut shaped things that you can put in the water that have BT in them that'll affect the mosquito larvae. It won't affect the fish or any birds that are um, maybe eating the fish out of your pond. And then we have spinicide. And this we used to think was gonna be our solution for um, a really great um, organic pest control. It's from a soil bacterium and it kills um, the insects when they ingest it. And it's effective on all kinds of insects, but the biggest problem is, is that it's toxic to bees. And so you need to be very careful about when you use this, um, because if you have a lot of flowers and bees are visiting, then you could kill off um, these bees, which is something that you don't want to do. And, but uh, it is an organic product. And so this is wait, you know, maybe, wow, I don't know what else I can do. Maybe this is that next step you can take, but. Um, being very cautious when you spray it, or maybe spraying it when it's still cold, like it is in the morning in Flagstaff before the bees are very active. And then um, I'll leave my insect talk with this. Always remember to, to choose the least toxic method for control so you can protect your beneficials and your pollinators. Yay. Okay, so um, that's it for insects. So I'll spend about 25 minutes talking about disease problems. And again, you know, we're going to think about um, our IPM um, strategies and we really want to know what the plant is and is it really a problem? So what does the plant look like normally? And what does it look like when it's healthy? What does it look like at certain times of the year? And then think about um, what is causing the problem. And so it's really getting to know your plant material, not so important in the vegetable garden because we know what we're planting, but this is um, a, you know, a, a problem with ornamental plants because sometimes people will say, well, I got this plant that has purple flowers and something bad is happening. And you, I don't know, what is it? And so it really helps when you know what the plant is. And um, are these lumps normal? So um, this was a master gardener um, sent this picture to me and he said, I found this 
you know, something grew growing on my potato plants. Is it normal? Um, well, he had never seen it before. Um, this is the potato flower here. We don't always see potato flowers and these are actually the potato fruit. And so, you know, it's just something he hadn't thought about, but um, we do see a lot of insect galls on um, plants. And this is a picture of an insect gall, it's on oak. Um, is it a problem? Sometimes it can be, sometimes they're just ornamental, but that was one of the reasons why he was concerned. What, what if it's an insect gall and I'm gonna have more insects on my potato plants? But this is actually pretty normal, but I don't know why um, some years the, fruit, the flowers and fruit are produced and why they aren't other years. So when we're thinking about a problem, um, we have like two um, problems on plants in our vegetable garden. We have two um, major groups and one group are, of problems are caused by pathogens and we call these the biotic factors. And we're gonna talk about those things that are infectious. So those are the diseases such as a fungal problems, bacterial problems, virus problems, and there's a couple other ones, but those are what we're gonna talk about today. And then we have these non-living factors and, um, and that word pest should not be there. And I'm not sure why that's there. It should say abiotic. So um, just put your finger over that word and pretend that that's not there. But non-living factors would be weather, mechanical damage, um, chemical injury, cultural practices. And it could be um, like wildlife damage, even though they're living, but you know they're kind of attacking the plant. Um, uh, and so we do put those in this category. So our biotic factors, um, we have fungi, oops, sorry. Um, and they cause 70 to 80% of the problems. Then we have bacteria, viruses, and nematodes. Now, we don't have the right conditions for fungal path for many fungal pathogens. So um, that's why we don't have that many diseases like you would maybe in Washington or Oregon or Maryland or places like that, where there's a lot more humidity, a lot more rain, and a, just a lot more opportunity for these fun, fungi to grow. So here's a picture of the powdery mildew. That's a nematode. And then this is curly top virus in that picture. Now, if we look at our non-living factors and other pests, so in the other pests, I'm talking about like the wildlife damage and um, kids with a pocket knife and some things like that. Um, but there's so many things can happen, such as temperature extremes, wrong soil pH, the wrong amount of light, moisture problems, nutrition problems, herbicide damage, cultural practices, mechanical injury, et cetera, et cetera. And in Northern Arizona, the majority of the problems are caused by non-living factors versus the diseases. And it's just because we don't have the right environment for many of those diseases. But a lot of times people say, well, I got this problem, what can I spray? But it might be caused by your poor watering practices. So we'll just talk a, quickly about a couple um, problems caused by non-living factors. And one, which many of us have seen on our tomatoes is blossom and rot. So it's not an infection. We, call, we can call it a disease, but it's not caused by a pathogen. And it has to do with calcium deficiency. And the calcium is, you know, we have calcium in our soil. It's just not getting to the blossom end of that um, growing tomato fruit. And so the cells don't grow um, very well and they cause this kind of leathery thing down at the bottom. So it's called blossom and rot. It's not really rotting. Um, and there are some varieties that are tolerant of this. And one of the ways to help with this problem is to maintain even soil moisture. And I think the, the best thing you can do if you have this as a problem is have a really deep soil for your tomatoes so they have a big root system. So they're taking up adequate water um, to move that calcium up to the blossom end of um, these developing fruit. Uh, a couple tomatoes that are have some tolerance or early girl, better boy, Walter, um, Jet Star. Roma is really more susceptible, but it can come and go. You can have it on your plants for two or three weeks and then the environment changes and then you don't have it for four or five weeks. And so it is a little bit frustrating because of that and um, regular water does help. 
and you can also get it on peppers. You can also get it on eggplant. We had it on eggplant in our bus stop garden, but now we have a much deeper soil in our bus stop garden. So I have a feeling um, we're gonna have this um, under control. And we also have a drip irrigation system that really helps with um, maintaining good soil moisture. So a couple other tomato problems are um, fruit splitting due to irregular water. Um, watering sun scald. So a lot of us don't thin our tomatoes because we don't want to see sun scald. Um, sometimes this happens after you get a big hailstorm. Hail strips out off the leaves. The leaves have protected the tomato and now all of a sudden that poor tomato is um, subjected to a lot of sun sunshine. And then cat facing is caused by irregular pollination and also by cool temperatures. That's not something we can really do anything about, especially um, you know, we can just have some cold nights that can really affect how um, that tomato or that flower can is pollinated. So nitrogen deficiency, um, I think this is a big problem for a lot of new gardeners um, because nitrogen is really, that's the limiting factor for a really successful vegetable garden. It's mobile in the plant. So you'll look for yellowing of the leaves and you'll see, you know, like these broccoli heads that are not really big. and you know, I used to think that I only needed compost in my garden and that was going to be enough nitrogen. And then, um, and I had an okay garden, but when I started adding a little bit more nitrogen and then also adding sulfur to lower the soil pH, my garden is so much better. And so that was just something that sometimes compost will have the, the right amount of nitrogen and sometimes it won't. And side dressing in the middle of the season with nitrogen is something that can really help boost your um, vegetable garden. So we have diseases that can be caused by fungi. Of course, on the left, we have powdery mildew. On the right, we have um, early blight on tomato. Um, a couple, um, so many folks are starting um, seedlings right now. I actually had two phone calls today at the office. We're gonna have to get those phone calls to not come to me, but they're really fun to answer these questions. But, you know, one um, person said, yeah, you know, my seedlings aren't doing very well. And Gail talked about how to grow seedlings well when she talked about plant propagation, but we have a couple fungal problems. And the real key is, is to have healthy, fast growing plants. And that means using lights if you're indoors, and then sometimes rotating the crops. Um, around if you've had it in the garden and of course sanitation and um, having clean um, sterile potting soil particularly for those seeds um, because those little seedlings can be really susceptible to these fungal diseases and here's oh this is so sad when you see your little squash seedlings do this and then of course in the nursery we don't see this very often anymore um, these are vinca plants but there are a lot of um, in, um, there are a lot of fungicides used in nursery production so that all the plants look really, really great. And so if you're concerned about that, then buy from a local CSA that has uh, plant shares or grow your own seedlings would be a way that you um, wouldn't be bringing plants in that have had a lot of fun, um, fungicide sprayed on them. But when you see this in a flat of plants, don't buy it, just run the other way. Powdery mildew is something that we get um, a lot of, and usually it's at the end of the season. It's one of those fungi that doesn't need standing water to germinate. It likes those cooler temperatures when um, in August, when the monsoons are around and um, there's hundreds of different types of powdery mildew. We just all call them powdery mildew, powdery, powdery mildew on grape, powdery mildew on beans, powdery mildew on cucumber. Powdery mildew on grape does not affect cucumber, but you have the right conditions. So you probably could have several different kinds of powdery mildew growing on different kinds of plants. So it needs the living tissue to survive and, um, and the damage is probably the biggest problem. Well, the biggest problem is, is it just doesn't look very attractive, but it reduces the plant's ability to photosynthesize because you have this white mycelium on top of the leaves. It doesn't usually kill the plant. Um, and in some cases, when leaves get necrotic and the fall off, the fruit can become sunburned. So I usually don't, um, you know, I don't say, I say, you know, it's usually not a problem. It does bother some people. Um, I don't know if I have a yeah, I do have a solution in there. 
So it, this is where it is, you know, you have to make that decision if it's a problem or not. And of course, there are some resistant varieties that you can use. Um, and of course, you can remove your plant material at the end of the growing season to prevent overwintering. We usually don't compost those squash leaves that have a lot of powdery mildew. Spacing can help, um, but many of us don't have a lot of space, so we crowd our, our plants together. Um, and then there are some chemical controls. Sulfur products will work, um, but you have to be careful that um, it's not too warm out or your plants can be burned. Um, potassium bicarbonate products, sodium bicarbonate products, and then there is a fungicide called chlorothalonil, which um, is, that's like the big gun when you have, um, you really want to get powdery mildew under control. Every once in a while, it is a problem. We saw it once on a crab apple tree that it looked like the tree was going to die. And in that situation, um, bicarbonate products weren't going to touch it because those have to be used early. And so that was one time when we did recommend using a um, fungicide. And this is the fungicide that homeowners have available. And it's pretty effective. Um, so um, we also can have vascular wilts caused by fungi. And you can. Um, we see this um, really quick collapse in the plants and you can look, um, break off the stem and look at healthy tissue. And here we, um, we don't see healthy tissue that's in strawberry. So you can buy plants that um, there isn't any control for um, verticillium wilt, but there are many, many vegetable varieties that have um, disease resistance. And these are not GMO plants. This is a plant breeder would um, grow out 10,000 cucumbers and they would make selections of which of those cucumber plants didn't succumb to verticillium well. And it's just classic plant breeding. So that's how those um, varieties have been developed. Now they're, um, you can also use crop rotation and for, of course, controlling weeds that um, have that will, and then of course sanitation, just cleaning up your dead plants and not composting them, you know, just throwing them, throwing them away. Early blight is another fungal problem. Um, we get it on tomatoes and potatoes and other members of the Solanaceae family that um, tomatoes and potatoes are in. And this um, bullet-like um, lesion on the leaf is a giveaway that it's early blight. And I don't know if Gail found tomatoes that look like this. Um, but that doesn't look like a tomato that you want to eat. And then you will find lesions on the stems and twigs. Now, uh, it's caused by alternaria. And so if you're looking for um, disease resistance, you'll look for um, plants that are resistant to alternaria. Uh, and it has those necrotic spots. Um, and of course, the fruit drops prematurely, and you just have those infections. Up the fruit that just make them something that you don't want to harvest and eat. We buy these is path path pathogen free and remove effect infected plant material. Um, overhead irrigation can create more of a problem and space plants for good airflow, but you can look for um, disease resistance. But the thing that really controls it is this fungicide called chlorothalonil. Um, and so buying um, plants that have resistance to this, but also just buying, you know, really good um, plant starts that where you don't bring this material into your garden, which I think some of us might have done last year. And I think it was because we were buying um, bedding plants like crazy because it was, you know, COVID times. And I think that the production um, or the big nurseries, the big, big nurseries were um, pushing to get the plants out the door for us to buy. And I think that's how some of us brought in early blight because we don't normally see it as a problem in Northern Arizona. We also can get late blight and late blight um, causes these funny lesions on tomatoes too. Um, you're not gonna see, uh, those um, target shaped lesions on the leaves like you do for early blight. This is caused by um, Phytophthora, which is the same fungus that caused the um, potato famine in Ireland. So again, use um, pathogen free seed, but usually most of the seed that we purchase 
is pathogen free. And again, remove plant material. Oh, I made a mistake on this slide. I went the wrong direction. I am so sorry. Um, uh, so late blight is caused by Phytophthora infestans. And um, of course you'll see these necrotic spots on the leaves and brown lesions on the stem and brown spots on the fruit. And here's some pictures of what the leaf, the lesion would look like on the leaf. Um, this is what it looks like in potatoes. And this is the browning on the stem. And this was my garden a couple years ago. And I think I got late blight in my garden and we planted potatoes in that same bed the next year, the potatoes did not do very well. So one of the management strategies for late blight is crop rotation. So if you have it in your garden one year, don't plant tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, or peppers in that bed for about three to four years because you're gonna have that fungal um, fungus in the soil. And of course there is this fungicide, fungicide that I mentioned, chlorotholonil, but there are also some tomato cultivars that have resistance. And one of our um, local um, growers in town offered Mountain Magic tomatoes last year. And I was like, I was kind of curious, well, where'd that one come from? So there's a whole series of tomato cultivars under this mountain series. Well, they're, they have resistance to late blight. And so I thought that was kind of cool. So, you know, it was like, well, why would I plant that? Well, that was a reason, but there's some other ones here. Um, you might have to purchase the seed and start your own plants because um, these aren't common in the trade. And um, I have to say, we don't have seeds for any of these cultivars in our seed library right now, but maybe we will next year. We also have diseases caused by bacteria. Um, and this on the left is bacterial wilt on tomato. And of course, it's kind of hard. To, what's the difference between this and verticillium wilt? The whole plant just collapse. There is no chemical control for this one either. You're going to remove infected plants. But you can ID it um, by breaking off the stem and putting it in water. And you're going to see this, um, um, this stuff coming out. And we call this bacterial streaming from the stem. And so that would be a way that you could identify it as a bacterial wilt. Again, you're gonna um, get rid of all that plant material, but it doesn't carry over in the soil. So you wouldn't have to um, worry about crop rotation as much. And here is bacterial wilt on squash. And another way you can um, look for it is when you break the stem in half, you'll see these kind of like streams. Um, in between um, the squat, the pieces of squash, and that's kind of like um, that bacteria um, um, that's making it kind of mucusy. And so that's something else you can look for. And again, you'll just have to dig it all up and get rid of it. And then um, the last couple of slides here: um, diseases caused by viruses. So when we um, are looking for plants and we see yellowing, that could be due to nitrogen deficiency. It could, if your blueberry plants have yellowing leaves, it's probably due to um, iron chlorosis. Um, and the leaves won't be fully formed. Um, and you'll see modeling. And so that's a little different than just the older leaf being yellow, which um, is how leaves that have nitrogen deficiency would look. And we do have a couple viruses. Um, one is beet curly top virus. And this is transmitted by the beet leaf hopper. And it didn't used to be a problem in Northern Arizona, but a couple people have um, mentioned it out in the Dhoni Park area. And so you'll have yellowing leaves and the leaves are cupped, the plants are stunted. And one of the ways to treat this is to cover your plants in the beginning with a floating row cover to keep out the beet leaf hopper. So it can't carry that virus and feed on the plants and infect your plants. So um, that is one easy method and um, plant border rows with non-susceptible crops that can shield the tomatoes. Um, so if you had corn on either side, maybe you wouldn't have, um, I see somebody wants to be admitted there. Maybe you wouldn't, the beet leaf hoppers wouldn't find your tomato plants that are in um, the middle. 
So I say if that they do affect beets, but what they really do affect are tomatoes and particularly in the Dhoni Park area and in Chino Valley and in um, the Verde Valley. And so here's uh, some pictures of curly top virus here. And here is a picture of the plants being covered. So that's a way of not having to use an insecticide to control this problem. And then I think this is my last one. And so this is tomato spotted wilt virus. And I had this on my tomatoes. Um, and it was a real puzzle to me. I couldn't figure this one out for the longest time. But this picture down in the bottom here, that's from my tomatoes that I picked. So. Uh, so somehow some critter brought that in because most viruses are transmitted by an insect and tomato spotted wilt virus is not seed borne um, and the plants get affected early in the season from thrips and so you know thrips are around and you can look for necrotic spots on the leaves the stunting of the plants but um chlorotic rings on the mature fruit was the real giveaway. And so you can control your thrips. So you can use your sticky trap to see if you have thrips. And if not, you can also use your white sheet of paper, white sheet of paper, put a stem of your plant over the white sheet of paper, shake it. And if you see these little tiny specks that are about an eighth of an inch long, they just look like little dash marks moving around on your piece of paper, that's an indication that you have thrips. And so then you're gonna to wanna to think about controlling the thrips. I haven't had a lot of thrips at my house. I haven't had tomato spotted wilt virus for a couple years. I have actively tried to control thrips. Um, we have moved the tomato plants out of the garden. So, and I'm not gonna ask questions now because I wanna give Cindy a chance to present, but if you have any great pest pictures or disease pictures, you can send them to my email because I really like to add um, local pictures to my collection. So I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna let Cindy take over. And then we, if you have questions um, or have questions about you know, something that I presented or other, um, uh, pests or diseases that I didn't talk about, I'll be happy to answer those um, later. And I've stopped my share, but I'm not sure whose screen is on right now. There's Cindy. Hi. Okay. I'm going to mute myself now. Thanks, Hattie. That was great. Sure. Oops. I unmuted myself. Hi, everybody. Wow, Hattie, that was great. That was really informative. I thought I knew a lot about insects, but not all that. That was so terrific. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about how to prevent gophers from getting into your garden. It's not really about how what to do with them once they're in your landscaping or something. I live in Timberline and that's just a, kind of a perennial problem year after year. Um, so we will start with, um, actually this gopher, I walked outside, I didn't have any pictures of gophers. And then on Saturday, I walked outside and uh, I found this gopher and I was able to get <laughs> really close to it. It wasn't in my vegetable garden, it was just in my landscaping. So I just couldn't believe it, I got a picture. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, you're going to you're going to find a plot for your garden. So this is when you are first starting your garden. And this was um, 14 years ago. This is my garden from 14 years ago. So we made a wooden frame and then we cut down. Um, we dug down for several inches and the deeper you can dig, the better. If you can't dig too deep, deep and get a lot of soil, you might have to purchase your own soil. So, and we left, of course, we left the soil on, we kept that soil because we're gonna mix it. 
and then um, yeah, keep that soil. And then you're going to, and that's what it looks like. You can see that this was the original soil. Let's see if I can find my pointer here. There we go. Didn't want to turn on. I didn't get it. Anyway, to the left of that box is my original soil. And so to the right is where we dug down. Okay, then what we did was we got one inch um, wide holes of poultry wire and we laid it both crosswise and lengthwise. And not only that, but up the sides too, because of course they're gonna dig underneath those boards. Um, so that's probably the most important place to actually put it to so make sure that all of your poultry wire goes up all of the sides and then you're going to staple gun all of that wire in place very securely. And there it is, a, I can show you that that's what the poultry wire looks like. So don't forget to lay it both crosswise and lengthwise. And by the way, we did this with all of our trees also. And people told us that, well, maybe that's gonna get, gonna, um, tangle up the roots of the trees and it didn't. I don't know, maybe it's done it for other people, but it didn't do it on our property. And our spruce tree is like huge now and it never had any problem. So we planted our spruce tree 14 years ago. So, and it never had any problems, but I think you might be taking a chance if you're gonna try and actually put trees in with this poultry wire, but it worked with all of our trees. We Once we did this, we never lost any trees to the gophers. So then you're going to mix your native soil and um, if you need to purchase or go out and get some other soil to, to mix with it, because you, you want quite a deep garden if possible. Um, tomato plants, as Hattie said, and some other plants would do much better if they can go really deep into the roots so that they don't get that blossom end rot. So then you get your organic matter, you get lots of it. I think you need about 10% of your soil mixture to be um, organic matter. So we just used um, regular compost, but you can use aged um, animal manure, um, whatever you would use. At the bottom, that's a picture of my granddaughter probably about eight years ago. And that is corn that was grown in that plot that I have that picture of. And then we made a fence. Um, so we put just those stakes up around the garden and we um, made a fence out of that same type of chicken wire. And um, I'm a little bit um, physically challenged, so I could not step over all that chicken wire. And so my husband fashioned that gate right there and it just swings open. It's not on hinges or anything. It's, it's a really simple gate that, that swings open. And then um, you need to remember to add new organic matter each fall. And there's my granddaughter just this last fall um, adding some organic matter, of course, um, we need a whole lot more than just that. And um, we did have problems with gophers finally last year in one of the gardens, not this particular one. One of the gardens did get a couple of gophers in there and that was kind of bad, but you know, that chicken wire is gonna wear out. Now we know it takes about 14 years to wear out, at least in our neighborhood. So it, we didn't have any gopher problems for um, about 14 years. And um, we have lots of prairie dogs too. They didn't even seem to try to bother to get in there. Um, and uh, we were able to live trap any ground squirrels before they got into the garden. I'm sure if we hadn't live trapped the garden the ground squirrels, or I guess they're called rock squirrels in Arizona. Um, I think they would have been able to climb over that little fence there. They're pretty, um, they're pretty dexterous. And we did actually one year get a rabbit that somehow got in there and 
it was really weird because we had lettuce growing all over that garden and it didn't eat any of it. I think it just wanted to make a nest. It just dug this shallow hole and I know that's what they do to make a nest. It was really weird. <laughs> and there's my granddaughter again. She's putting more organic material. And um, this winter, um, we decided, my husband Hugh and I decided that somehow that all of our soil in there was getting too compacted and it just seemed to kind of disappear after all these years. So we had to go out and buy new soil and uh, we had great big mounds of it. And there you can kind of see um, in the foreground is our eight by 10 garden, which is kind of in a shady spot. That's the one that got the gophers last year. And then in the background, there's a tiny four by four garden where we always put zucchini. And then the one in the way back is my our 10 by 10. And we used to always put corn in there, but now we're experimenting with like green beans and um, even lettuce and just everything that we grow. We make a great big garden back out there. So one day we'll probably start growing corn again. And there you can see how the, the fence um, is actually it's stapled to the frame of the garden and it goes all the way down to the bottom of the garden. And uh, that is it. <laughs> so if you um, have troubles with gophers, you know, you don't, we have lots of other landscaping on our property. Of course, we can't put chicken wires everywhere. So we do have problems every once in a while with gophers. And we found out that if you really have to trap, you can use gophinator traps. Those have worked much better for us than the old fashioned kind. So that's it. Good luck on preventing gophers from getting into your gardens. And hopefully they just, you don't have a problem with them. Thank you so much, Cindy. Those were really great photos. So this class is pretty small um, tonight. If anybody has any questions for either Hattie or Cindy, please feel free to just unmute yourselves and ask away and we can have conversation for the last uh, few minutes of the class. For this is Carmen, sorry, let me turn on the video too. Uh, so neem oil, um, how, is, how safe is for you humans? I mean, in the sense that um, I just had to spray some today. Uh, I've been growing um, arugula and spinach in a green, greenhouse. And today I found, uh, they look a little, I don't know what they are. <laughs> I can't, I don't know. But anyway, uh, in the past I used uh, aphi um, I'm sorry, neem oil on those and they disappear pretty soon. But uh, how soon can I cut the, the leaves and put it in my salad after spraying with neem oil? So I don't have the label in front of me, but it is considered a pesticide and it should have a label that says, I have this book right here and I was just going to look at it, look it up really fast. And so I don't really know, but that's something that anytime you spray the product, you usually there's, you know, how many days that you have to wait for something like malathion, it's actually two weeks. Um, I still I I, I looked, I mean, the first thing before I sprayed, I looked at the label and there was not a word hmm. about, I mean, it just says, oh, it works better if you keep a spray in every two weeks. <laughs> but yeah, but what about my safety? What, when can I eat this? Uh, I could not find it and I really looked at it. So, hmm. sorry, that's why I was picking your brain, Harry. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know, but that, that does bother me that it's not on the label. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it should be. Maybe, you know, there are so many different products out there that contain neem oil. Maybe just whatever the brand that you have, um, 
put the brand name in and put MSDS. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. like a Google search. Yeah, yeah. Because legally they sh should have a material safety data sheet and it should be on the label, but maybe that would be a good start because sometimes you can Google search that information and find it online. So I um I do have this the truth about organic gardening which is by Jeff Gilman he's a I'm an ex extension spe specialist in the uh, Midwest and what he does is he looks at products and he tells you the pros and the cons and the bottom lines and you know there's a lot of stuff out there and what works and what doesn't and what he says is that most people who apply neem use it in small doses and it shouldn't be toxic to people or animals however allergies to neem have been reported as far as and have negative effects on sperm and abortive effects in rats so so um it's not considered something that's completely um safe um and you know with a product it should say you know wear a mask or wear gloves too if it's considered um you know to have some kind of properties that aren't safe um despite these concerns if applied with care um and particularly um, the aqueous neem-based products should, um, let's see, I'm not reading that right. Well, there's some, there are some formulations that aren't recommended. This book doesn't say, but it does say that it's, you know, it has a really low um, toxic, toxicity rating but it doesn't mean it's risk-free. And so I think you asked a really, really good question. And that's probably something that um, now I'm gonna have to think about a little bit because I'm just throwing it out there. Neem oil, neem oil. Um, Frank, do you have a comment? You unmuted yourself about neem oil. Oh, oh. no, well, I was gonna ask another question, but oh, okay. I know when I was buying edible flowers from, uh, um, I can't think of the name, Warner's. Um, the guy said he couldn't sell me pansies because he used neem oil on them. And I didn't question, I really, but he made me, he made me curious. I was just looking it up on my phone. Um, and most people seem to be saying that it's okay, but I don't know if I can trust any of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So sorry, Carme, but I think that's, that's okay. another newspaper mm -hmm. article. Okay. Yeah, it's like everybody says, oh, this is organic, this is safe. It's like, well, no, <laughs> not yeah. whatever, you know, whatever, everybody claims something is organic and therefore safe. And no, it's not always. Yeah. And that's, you know, with like pyrethrin, you know, it's from chrysanthemums, but it's actually pretty, you know, and it's in a dust form that we can breathe in. And that's why it's really um, not a good thing to use on a regular basis. Or, you know, wear a mask and wear gloves and wash your clothes afterwards. So, mm -hmm. okay. but thanks for bringing that up. Okay. Well, I have a question that sounds really stupid, but um, <laughs> I've seen it a lot. Have you ever heard of using milk to suppress powdery mildew? I have. I and tried I it. Huh? I tried it, but it rained every time I sprayed it yeah. on. So <laughs> I was like, I don't know if it did any good or not. So I, I think it, I think it um, affects the ability for the spores to get established on the surface. I think that's how it works, and that's how kind of like how compost tea might work by having maybe some good fungi growing or something like that. And so that's about all I know about it, though. Um, and I've never tried it. I tried a good compost tea on my squash plants last year, and I may not have sprayed them thoroughly enough, but I still got powdery mildew. We have a question in the chat. Any recommendations on how to deter crows had issues with crows eating melons? Scarecrow? How to say it. <laughs> I don't know. I have a large dog and she chases them away. 
and she doesn't she doesn't dig in my garden so i'm lucky i think you know not all dogs would not dig since we're talking about animals what about avoiding the cats to pee on your beds um i've been thinking of uh, making like a cage <laughs> i mean i saw in a in a uh, catalog they sell it for ninety dollars. Like I'm gonna make it myself with a piece of wood and some chicken wire, um, but it's just really annoying. <laughs> I love the cats, but I want to kill them every single time I see them digging in my bed. <laughs> so, Our dog, besides, yeah. Besides the cages, any other suggestions uh, for the cats to stay away from the beds? No, I, you know, the dog works for me, but when I had a lawn that I didn't want them digging and I did buy a, a scented gel product that I spread everywhere, but that was in a lawn. I don't know if that's something that you would use in a vegetable garden. Um, Patty, one year you suggested pine cones and I did that in yeah. my in my garden and it seemed to work because I have a bad kitty oh. who uses all of my beds as a litter box. Oh. Carme, um, you can come to my house and pick up my pine cones. <laughs> oh, I live in Donny. I have plenty of, <laughs> I mean, it, it, we, we use pine cones from the forest to start yeah. fi the, the fire and the stove. Uh, the, okay. Oh, pine cones. Yeah. Huh. Okay. All so, right. um, yeah, for this question about crows, I, that one, um, you know, if you'd want to see me, um, send me an email, I'm happy to look it up. Um, I don't know right now, but um, there is a series of articles on how to deal with wildlife um, problems, and it's from the University of Nebraska. And they have something on almost every critter out there. And sometimes, you know, you can't be harming, you know, birds and things like that, but they might have a recommendation of what to do about crows and I of course was thinking well my dog really does chase them away but, but um, you know it's funny how they actually um, they really they were so thirsty they didn't care about the dog they came in for my um, bird bath to drink water um, because it was so dry out and so uh, I do know people do make cages for their plants that's mostly for the javelina down in Sedona and things like that and they just you know make a large um, enclosure like Frank and Jeff made at the Libby White Hospice home to just keep the critters out. So I don't know if that's that practical though for melons. Any yeah. other questions? Hey, I have a question. This is Kate Mahady. I'll turn on my video. Every year I try to grow tomatoes. I get that split that your slide said Hattie was from irregular watering, but I have a drip system and it waters them every day. So any tips on that? So how deep is the soil in your bed? Uh, it's not that deep. Yeah. So I, I, I think that balance is kind of hard and that's why I, I think 18 inches can help. Um, okay. But also, um, have you had that problem on cherry tomatoes? You know, sometimes it's just easier to go with the, you know, the smaller tomatoes. And my new favorite is black crim, which is about an inch, an inch and a half doesn't quite, you know, slice up like a Kellogg's breakfast tomato. Um, <laughs> I've never had cracks in Kellogg's breakfast tomato, but I have had it a lot in Cherokee purple to the point where I'm not going to grow them anymore. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, that, that plant, it has to pull up so much water through its, its root system. And if you have a bigger root system that you can fill up the whole area with water. Now we don't water every day, but we have a you know, it's only been like 18 years, we've really managed to have a really deep soil, but it's, it's taken time. And how often do you water them? Um, with the drip system, it's um, three times a week. Um, and it's okay. on for an hour. So it's okay. really filling that whole 18 inches with water. 
And then sure. sometimes more, especially if it's hot in August after the monsoons, you know, yeah. we might have three weeks and the plants are really big. Um, and then it, it can be daily then. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Sure. Celebrity tomatoes tend not to split. It's a hybrid. The one year I tried to grow them from seeds, they all split. So it's <laughs> a, the exception. But if you buy the plants, I've never really seen them split much. Okay, good to know. I'll, I'll give that a try. I forget, I left the um, little plant signs out out in the garden just so that I could remember <laughs> what they were because I knew if I brought them in, I'd lose them or throw them away. Um, so I'll take a look. Uh, the I do like the bigger ones because they're they're fun to slice and um, put in stuff. But the, I'll I'll take a look at the celebrity. I it's used medium. celebrities and they to... never split. Oh, good to know. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? They don't necessarily have to be about plant problems and diseases. This is the very last class. So any questions at all about anything that we covered in the series? Okay, it looks like we did a good job then. I, I would like to hear about the black creme tomato from Hattie. So, can you hear me, Hattie? I can. Um, okay. Did you did you find plants or did you use seed? So I don't grow um, anything from any seed starts myself anymore because I just don't have time. <laughs> but okay. I got them at okay. Violas, and they have a wide okay. a good. wide selection of plants. And it was just like, well, this one looks interesting, and this is available. But it's just a really nice. You know, it's only, you know, about an inch and a half or two inches wide, and I, it just produces a lot of fruit. So it makes, it's really nice in salads. It's not great for slicing for your tomato and mayonnaise, salt and pepper sandwich, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the Kellogg's breakfast is really good for that one. Um, it's supposed to be uh, early blight resistant also. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. yeah. Okay, thank you. But then, you know, I am hoping that I get the plants that I want um, when I go to the nursery too. And that's, you know, that's, I'm gambling that they have what I want and I probably should start growing plants from seed. Do you know if they're gonna have their tomato best this year? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't heard anything. Okay. So Gail, somebody's asking about how long um, the class recordings will be up on the website. They will remain up on our YouTube channel um, for as long as they let us leave them up. Feasible future. I'm not okay. sure how many videos that we can have on there, but I'm going to leave those up as long as I can. Good. And they're nice and organized now. I figured out how to do that. So it should be pretty easy to find them. Gail, they're, they're very nicely organized. Thanks I noticed for noticing. that. <laughs> As I had to go look at one of my videos that I made. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I got yeah. on the U of A um, YouTube channel, like the main campus one, just watched the briefing from the president. And I was like, how do they do that? So I, I want our YouTube channel to look like that. So I figured it out one day last week. Gail, so 20 years yeah. from now, Gail and I are going to go back and look at those and say, dang, we look good, didn't we? <laughs> well, yeah, there are a lot of you on there, Hattie. I'm just behind the scenes. <laughs> Gail, could you send that link again? I apologize, but um, I think I, I lost those links in okay. the thousands of emails that we get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll resend Normal. it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it seems like, the, oh, oh, we're getting a thank you. Thanks for joining us.
Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a really fun series and I hope that everybody learned a ton and I just wanna take one moment to thank all of our Master Gardener presenters throughout the series. Um, Jim, Frank, Jackie, and Cindy. And thank you, Hattie, for presenting tonight. And um, I am going to send out an end of course survey. And hopefully everybody will fill that out because that just gives us really great feedback on what we can do better, how you like the classes. And then if you have any ideas for future courses, I have a um, question where you can just fill that in. And um, yeah, thanks everybody. And I hope that your gardens are going to be awesome this summer. Thank and you, so you can much. send both the great pictures and the problem <laughs> pictures. We like both. Right. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you all. Thanks. That was a great series. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.